Okay, so the topic of today's lecture is called multi-view stereo. And so this is one of the last, I guess this is the last uh, kind of 3D acquisition method that we're going to talk about. Um, and this is the only one that doesn't involve any sort of um, interaction with the scene, right? So for example, for LiDAR and for structured light, in both those cases, we were pushing light into the scene and looking at the light in a camera, right? Well, I guess for LiDAR, there really was no camera. We were using a photo detector, so we pushed laser spots out into the world. We measured them coming back. Uh, and for structured light, we pushed, you know, either a laser light stripe or a laser pa or, a, or a white light pattern into the world, and we looked at that with a camera, right? And so part of the problem with those is that in each case, we're kind of interfering with the scene, right? We're pushing stuff into the scene that wasn't originally there. It would be great if we could do stuff with purely images, right? So we just take a bunch of pictures of a scene, and then we use that to reconstruct 3D. And so, as you may know, you know, these kinds of uh, large number of images, kind of passive techniques, have become much more uh, popular lately. We'll talk about a bunch of kind of off-the-shelf consumer multi-view stereo stuff at the end of class. Um, so, one way to think about this is that fundamentally, multi-view stereo is kind of a combination of stuff that we already talked about. So we talked about uh, camera calibration in chapter six, right? So we talked about if you've got a whole bunch of cameras, how do you know where all of them are uh, positioned and oriented in a 3D space just from looking at image correspondences, right? So we know we should be able to solve the camera calibration problem just by looking at images. So we start from the assumption that all the cameras are calibrated. And then we also talked in chapter five about how do we estimate a dense correspondence between each pair of images. And so, you know, we talked about that in the context of optical flow and in the context of stereo, right? So you can imagine that what you're really doing is you're trying to simultaneously estimate the correspondence between a whole large number of images as opposed to just uh, a pair of images, right? But still, the idea is the same. And so if I know where the cameras are and I know where every corresponding pixel between a pair of images is, then I can just simply triangulate through every corresponding pair and I can get a dense set of 3D points, right? And that's exactly the fundamental idea behind multi-view stereo. And so there are um, lots of different ways to approach this uh, depth or this 3D from images problem. And so I'm just gonna highlight maybe uh, a few of these big picture uh, approaches. Let me just say though that I think it's still true, although it's, it's getting closer, you know, that uh, something that is purely image-based, no, no structured light, no laser scanning, is still not gonna be as good accuracy-wise as something where you do push light into the scene and look at it, right? So uh, multi-view stereo is never gonna be as good as something where you put light stripes into the scene or, or scan the scene with a laser, right? Um, so you can do pretty well, but not like as well. Is that an arm up? Yep. Yeah. So when you say it will never be as good, is that a limitation of this computational power that we have? So oh, I see. if you get the realm more complete, let's say we get the infinite computer right. power at this, at this problem. So could you actually end up with something as good? Right. Could it ever be as good? So yeah, maybe I should be, maybe I should back off of my grand claim a little bit. But you know, let me put it this way. So where do things like stereo, purely image-based things have problems, right? So say I'm looking at a flat white wall, right? So stereo will never be able to, you know, obtain direct actual correspondences on that wall. The best it can do is make some sort of assumption like, oh, I'm looking at a plane or I'm looking at a surface doesn't change very much. Or, or you put it this way, suppose you've got some sort of like, you know, wavy wall that has not enough waviness to generate a lot of shadows and stuff for the stereo to latch onto, but enough that you couldn't really you know, match up points on the wall, right? So that's something that, that images will never be able to do very well, even if you had super high resolution images, but something like a LiDAR scanner that bounces physically off a point in the surface and comes back to you is gonna be able to disambiguate that kind of thing, right? So, you know, I think that when you've got like a highly textured object that multi-view stereo can do very well. Um, and in theory, the limitations for how well you can do are based on the resolution of your input images and your computational power to do the dense correspondence. I mean, um, you know, it's, it's fair to say that there are lots of, um, so multi-view stereo algorithms are generally made to operate on lots and lots of input images, but at the same time, I think that if you really dug down into the details that, you know, those algorithms are also not really well suited to taking like, you know, a thousand 4K digital cinema images and making a reconstruction, right? I think that computationally, 
probably multi-view stereo algorithms are still, you know, kind of starting by using kind of more tractable image sizes, and they're not using all the images that you have either. So they're probably throwing out a bunch of those images and then using them to get, you know, incrementally better and better 3D. So, you know, I think that if you have the time to spend on it, if you've got great cameras on it, then you could take several days to generate some amazing multi-view shot. But then you have to think about, okay, well, I could have just done that with a co-located camera and a LiDAR scanner or a structured light scanner. It would have taken me a lot less time, right? So that's where the balance is. Um, but, I mean, this is not to say that there are a lot of things that you can do with multi-view stereo that you can't do with LiDAR and structured light. So, for example, um, you know, one thing is that you can generate 3D constructions of things that don't exist anymore, or they don't exist in front of you. You just look at archival photos of things, right? So there was a, actually, this is a very um, timely, there was a great article in the New Yorker this week about uh, Paul Demovec at the uh, USC Institute for Creative Technologies, the guy who has developed all these light stages we talked about uh, a couple weeks ago. And so one thing that he said in that uh, article, which is very interesting, is that, you know, now it's very conceivable that you could look at uh, historical film of you know, actors who are either not around anymore or who are 40 years older and reconstruct their 3D facial geometry from purely images, right? You don't need to have their, you know, you don't have to try and make them up to look like they were younger. You can actually see them when they were younger and effectively get a 3D model just from, so what, I think they were saying there was one, you know, great shot of Harrison Ford from some movie long ago where he basically was kind of rotating his head under nice, even light, you know, it was like the ideal thing that you would do if you were trying to reconstruct just for images alone, right? And so now you could say, okay, I could take that, push it into a multi-view stereo algorithm and get like the 30 years ago Harrison Ford, right? So very conceivable to the point that, you know, there was some interesting discussion in the article about, you know, um, actors probably already are saying, you know, well, I don't remember doing that on set. And that's probably because they probably didn't do it on set and they've been 3D rendered to look like they were doing something, right? And so suddenly, you know, I'm sure that things like your your likeness rights are going to become a much, much bigger issue in terms of, you know, what have you been represented as doing, right? You, you suddenly lose the control over your own body. In some sense, you know, the, the actor's face and their mannerisms are like the most distinctive thing that they have, right? And if you can actually re, you know, simulate that somewhere else, you've taken a lot away from them, right? So it's, it's suddenly becoming a very interesting tricky technical issue. So that's a great article. And so unfortunately, it's not free online, but I really encourage you if you have a chance to take, it, take a look at it. Um, okay, so let me just say, first of all, that, you know, uh, just in passing, that so multi-view stereo um, was kind of um, kick-started in the same way that other things like just regular stereo and optical flow were by this multi-view stereo benchmark. So if you're interested in doing this kind of research, just like with you know, optical flow and, and regular stereo, you know, there is a nice set of data, you know, and these these data sets are basically like little tabletop models, basically. I'm not sure if I can, you know, so here's a little model Stegosaurus, right? So the idea is that, um, you know, someone went to the effort, uh, this was a combination of, I think, Microsoft and Middlebury, uh, to create these very nice, um, you know, 3D models of tabletop sized objects with a whole lot of calibrated cameras. And so for example, here, their full data sets have more than 300 calibrated cameras of this object. And then they also used, um, I believe they used structured light, uh, the cyberware model laser scanner. So I mean, I think that, you know, they use some sort of laser scanning to basically uh, generate the very accurate 3D models of these objects. So now what you have are number one, the true 3D object, and number two, lots of calibrated camera images of this object, and this is a way that you can benchmark your data against other people. And so again, just in the same way for these other algorithms, you've seen charts like this before, you have these kinds of things where you have, um, you know, the ground truth model, let's see, I guess if I just select one of these guys. Uh, right, so for example here, what you see on the left is one algorithm's result of a multi-view stereo algorithm, and this is the actual true scan, the ground truth, right? And so you can kind of scroll your way down through different multi-view stereo algorithms. Like this one is a little bit, you know, not as detailed. This, these are a little bit, you know, finer detailed. And so, you know, the idea is that you can kind of upload your results. And these days, again, to be taken seriously as a multi-view stereo paper, you basically have to compare yourself against these standard data sets. Um, also, 
There is another benchmark uh, by Streka et al. that is much more like large outdoor scenes. So instead of just looking at something that's like something on a turntable just in front of you, they did benchmarking for like building scale scenes. And so again, if you're interested in doing much larger scale multi-view stereo, then that's the data set that you should be benchmark benchmarking on, not this uh, smaller one. Okay, so let me talk about um, four basic techniques. And I'm gonna spend most of my time, I think, on the first one and on the third one. So the first one is what I would call uh, a volumetric method. And so this is actually kind of related to the visual hull idea that we were talking about in the context of markerless motion capture, right? So if you remember from uh, that lecture, so this I'd say volumetric methods. Right, so you guys just turned in this homework on, um, you know, kind of silhouette-based estimation, right? So the idea is that, okay, you know, I see the object out here, and I look at this object from multiple perspectives, and I obtain different silhouettes of that object. And the, the idea is that I can do 3D reconstruction by kind of, let me just make this a little bigger, sorry. I can do 3D reconstruction by kind of coarsely voxelizing the space, and then starting to ask, okay, so which voxels in the world are consistent with my images of the world, right? And so unlike the silhouette and edge-based, so we, we talked about the visual hull, right, in the markerless motion capture lecture. And so the visual hull starts only from kind of like this binary silhouette in each image, and it pushes that binary silhouette forward in space and looks at where those things intersect and says, okay, so the true thing must lie somewhere within this set of 3D voxels, right? So the kind of twist for um, multi-view stereo is that instead of thinking about just the silhouettes, we think about the actual images that we saw, right? So the idea is that, let me go back to my little uh, figure here. So what I would do is I would say, okay, let's think about this voxel in 3D space, right? What I do is I have all the cal calibrated cameras already. So I project that voxel back down into each camera view, and I ask, okay, did I see roughly the same color in each of the three camera views? If I did, then that voxel in 3D space is a good candidate to actually be truly there. If I didn't, so for example, if you know the cameras see like red, green, blue, instead of red, 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 they say, well, you know, this voxel can't be actually a true voxel because the cameras all didn't see the same color, right? And so you do that kind of modulo expected little color changes. So instead of just looking for a direct 100% match, you kind of have a cost function that says, how similar are the N voxel colors that I saw you know, in space? And the other thing is that you, know, you do allow for things like this. So in this case, this camera, so suppose that the gray uh, you know, thing of voxels was the true object, right? So in this case, you know, you have to allow for the fact that some of the voxels on the object may self-occlude, right? So if I have some sort of a non, uh, well, even even here, this this object is still convex, but from this perspective, this camera sees this voxel here first before it sees that voxel. So this camera doesn't necessarily have to agree on the coloring of this voxel. And so the idea is that you start to consider the voxels in a very specific pattern. And the initial voxel coloring approach, you had to also have a kind of a specific configuration of cameras to prevent bad things from happening, right? So the idea is that you kind of pushed your way through the voxels, starting close to the cameras, and then kind of pushing this plane of voxels away from the cameras. And at every point, you'd look at all the voxels in the plane, and you'd say, okay, which of these guys is consistent with all of the pictures that I saw, right? And so um, that was a little bit restrictive, um, but that was the first approach. So, um, you know, the first approach was, was voxel coloring. By Seitz and Dyer. That was followed by something called um, photo consistency or the photo hull. So the photo hull. That was Kudalakos and sites. And so the idea there was that basically you're trying to find the largest set of colored voxels in the world that are 
consistent with projecting those down into each of your calibrated camera images, right? And so the idea is that, you know, it's kind of similar to carving away voxels that can't possibly be consistent. Um, and so, you know, these algorithms are kind of what, almost what I would call classical. I mean, part of the problem with them is that you have to very finely voxelize up your space. And so that means if you want like a super high accurate scan, like if you want a millimeter accurate scan or a sub-millimeter accurate scan, you can imagine that your working volume is necessarily restricted by just how much computational memory and horsepower you have. Um, and so uh, the other thing is that in some of these earlier techniques, you were, you know, you, you want to make sure that you don't do anything that you later regret. So for example, if you were to remove a chunk of voxels that later you found out that, oh, you made a mistake and you needed those voxels, hard to get those voxels back, right? And so there have been some modifications to these kinds of voxel carving and voxel coloring algorithms that uh, don't let you, you know, don't let you recover from mistakes, or in some sense you can imagine kind of solving kind of like a, a graph cut problem, like a huge multi-label graph cut problem where you say, okay, you know, the label for each voxel corresponds to kind of a discrete disparity or a discrete XY position in each of the source images. So you have like this huge multi-label set that you could solve with some sort of like massive alpha expansion problem, right? Um, so, yeah, I, th I think that, you know, one of the nice things about these volumetric approaches is that, you know, unlike the methods that we're going to talk about next, they don't necessarily depend on any initial understanding about correspondences between the images, right? So they just look at where are the cameras and they start to push this plane of voxels through space and start to chew away 3D space until you've got something that is a colored set of voxels that's consistent with these images, right? Some of the methods we're going to talk about next are going to be um, much more, they're going to leverage the ideas behind sparse and dense correspondence much more. And consequently, those are the ones I think are really the top performing multi-view stereo algorithms now are the ones that are really using the uh, correspondences that you get from something like um, SIFT or feature matches. Okay, so like I said, volumetric methods I think are one of the first methods that people kind of looked at to approach this problem, but not what I would say are currently necessarily the best methods. Um, so there's also what I would call surface deformation. And so, you know, surface deformation methods kind of inherit their uh, methodology from uh, an old image processing computer vision algorithm called snakes or active contours, right? So basically the idea behind an active contour is that, you know, if I have a object in an image that I'm trying to segment, what I do, this is a tree, by the way, what I do is I basically build what looks like kind of a flexible rubber band. And so what I, what I have is kind of initially a set of, you know, edges connected by these vertices. They call this an active contour or a snake. And the idea is what I do is at every step I allow my vertices, my snake, to kind of try to wrap tightly around an object, right? And so the idea is that you try and build a cost function so that the edges of the snake are attracted to image edges, right? So when the snake is out in the middle of a flat region, it is kind of compelled to move towards somewhere where it's hitting an image edge, right? So the idea is you want to push these guys in closer to image edges, and there are various ways of, you know, kind of attracting these guys with this inward force until at the end they wrap tightly around the object that you care about, right? And so this was a very, um, you know, common way to do image segmentation for a long time. And, you know, one of the things that is tricky is that, um, number one, you need to have a large number of nodes to be able to kind of uh, wrap really tightly around this object. So for example, for my tree example, you know, if I just have like 20, you know, nodes, I'm probably not going to get a very conformal wrap around my object if I'm forcing things to be just straight lines between the edges. So maybe I need to have 200 points on my stake instead of just 20, right? Um, and so there's also a little bit of a trick in terms of how do you keep the uh, topology of this thing from, you know, being 
you know, from staying a nice, simple, closed curve, right? Because you can imagine that if I have something that's got like a narrow, you know, isthmus between two regions, that it's possible that the snake could kind of cross in on itself and that would be bad, right? So maintaining the topology of this, especially when the nodes get really close together, can also be a headache. And so really the way that people would solve this problem now would be instead of using a literal uh, snake, what they use is called a level set. And so the, light, the idea behind level set uh, image processing is that instead of trying to push this curve around, what you do instead is you say, okay, if I'm trying to segment, um, say I'm just trying to segment this circle, right? So what I do instead is I say, okay, instead I try and estimate a function of x and y so that this function is exactly zero around the boundary of the thing that I'm trying to estimate. And inside the object, it's negative, and outside the object, it's positive. And so this kind of gets around a lot of these things about keeping track of how many vertices I need and crisscrossing of the you know, edges of the snake and stuff like that. Um, the downside is that really to do this problem, you're kind of back to a volumetric method where you have to kind of discreetly voxelize up the space and then once you know what this function is in every voxel in the space, you extract all those voxels that have basically zero values of the level set. Um, so again, this is not to say this can't be done. This is, this is a very common thing to do. But it is still kind of a volumetric thing where you have to make choices about how dense is your voxel grid and stuff like that. And so how does this relate to multi-view stereo? Well, the idea is that instead of having a one-dimensional contour, instead what we have is like a three-dimensional triangle mesh that is wrapping tightly around the object in the world that we want to, you know, build a nice model of, right? And so the idea is that you start with maybe some really simple triangle mesh, like maybe you have a very nice sphere that you put right around the object in space. And then you start to deform the vertices of those triangles until it kind of wraps around the 3D object that you're trying to, trying to segment in the world. And so what you need is basically some sort of a cost function that says, you know, S is some sort of, for example, triangulated mesh or, you know, kind of a level set version of that. And what you try and do is something like, okay, I want to minimize the energy of the surface where there are a bunch of terms. So I have some measure of how well the surface matches up with each of the images, and then I have some measure of, you know, kind of similar to the motion, to the um, to the markerless motion capture, where I can say, okay, I need the silhouettes of the surface to project down to the silhouettes on the images, and then you usually have also what's called an internal force. This internal force is something that keeps the snake kind of. Um, you know, as tight as possible, right? So, I mean, you don't want a snake that is too, you know, loosey-goosey. You want something that's always going to be compelled to get the tightest boundary around an object that it can, right? So, you usually try to have a force that is always kind of pushing the snake to conform to something, right? And so, let's just talk for a second about, so we already kind of talked about this guy in the markerless motion capture section. This is kind of like something you can think of as kind of always, you know, pushing the snake to be tighter. And then, what is this thing? So this is basically saying something like, you know, how consistent is the surface with each of the images? And so, again, there are different ways to do this, but uh, the easiest thing to do would be to say, okay, I have some surface, and let me actually, I think I have a better picture of it than what I can draw. So I have some surface. This is, for example, my candidate triangle mesh, right? And what I do is I say, okay, I'm going to take a patch over in one image. I'm going to project it onto the 3D surface, and I find out where that patch land over here, and then I would have this dotted line box. And then what I could do is something simple like the normalized cross-correlation between every, you know, for every box I draw in one image, I can find out these dotted line boxes in all the other images and figure out what the cross-correlation is between each of those things, right? And so if the point on the surface is good, then I expect that when I project it back down the images, that the, the patches all kind of agree, right? One thing that you have to be careful of, though, and this is another way of illustrating it in this picture, is that you don't usually want to match square patches 
in one image to square patches in the other image, right? We had a picture long ago where we kind of showed that what's square in one image looks perhaps very non-square from the other image. And so what you can do is you have this triangle mesh already. You have a candidate triangle mesh, and you, you kind of use that mesh to mediate what you should be comparing. So you say, okay, this is my candidate. What I do is I take this rectangle, I push it up onto the mesh, I find out where does that, where does that rectangle hit my mesh, that gives me some weird 3D chunk of surface. Then I can project that weird 3D chunk of surface back down onto this other image. And then what I do is I compare the solid square here to the solid weird shape in the other image. And so the idea is that I should really be using the expected surface to tell me what the right set of pixels is to compare, right? Um, and so that kind of idea of using the reprojection of the, uh, of the square onto the surface and then projecting it back down onto the image. So I'm not just comparing squares to squares, I think is definitely an important aspect of getting a surface-based deformation model like this to work. Um, again, you can be a little bit, you know, if you don't want to figure out necessarily this weird non-standard object, at the very least you could kind of tell, okay, instead of comparing this to a square, maybe I should compare it to a skinny rectangle or a fat rectangle, depending on the kind of tangent uh, you know, kind of based on these angles, I can tell, will this square here project to something skinny over here or something fat over here? And I compare it against at least a family of possible correspondences instead of just the original square. Um, so again, you know, one of these, so one of the, you know, disadvantages of this technique, again, is that, um, you know, number one, since you're uh, generating this kind of, you're, you're evolving this 3D mesh, on the plus side, you know, your resulting 3D reconstruction is not going to have any holes in it, right? Because your original spherical, you know, initialization didn't have any holes in it. So you're basically just pushing the mesh in until it kind of matches up with all the stuff in 3D that you saw. And that's nice because, you know, one thing that you'll see in other multi-view stereo algorithms like what we're going to talk about next is that often you do have some sort of a missing data problem where if you just don't have good correspondences, you end up with missing points in the 3D world. And so this kind of gets around that by wrapping this kind of, you know, wrapping this uh, chunk of triangles around 3D space. Um, on the other hand, though, this is not really the right thing to do for a non tabletopy kind of scan, right? So for example, you know, the scans I showed you here uh, for the multi-view stereo, these are going to be okay for doing a volumetric-based method, right? So, for example, the stegosaur uh, is basically, I don't think that the stegosaur actually has any holes in it in the sense of, uh, you know, topology. The temple does have holes in it, but that's okay for volumetric methods if you're using a level set. So level sets can tolerate holes in the objects. And so that's another nice thing about using this level set approach. Um, but that being said, you know, if, if I'm looking to do multi-view reconstruction of a scene like this classroom, right, where there's lots of independent surfaces, lots of holes, definitely things are not part of one object, then this may not necessarily be the best way to go. Okay. Okay. So what then are, you know, kind of the currently top performing multi-view stereo algorithms? I think that it's fair to say that they're generally based on what I would call patches. Okay. And so there's a very well-known kind of family of algorithms that started with what was called uh, patch-based multi-view stereo. And so patch-based methods, I would say, are these days highly competitive. And so the idea is pretty simple, right? So again, the setup is we have a whole bunch of calibrated cameras. And we can do things, for example, like uh, estimate feature points like SIFT and SURF and so on between each of these cameras, right? So what we do is we assume that we have a whole bunch of cameras calibrated and in each camera, say we have a bunch of, you know, corresponding features. This is going to be a kind of a crappy picture because I didn't really plan it, but that's all right. So it is you just, just imagine that's a straight line there. So the idea is you could say, okay, well, for every bunch of features that I can really accurately match up between my set of images, I could triangulate through those points to get a single 3D point in space, right? And 
again, when you've got lots and lots of images of the same scene taken from you know, not like super differing points of view, you can generate a large number of sparse feature matches, right? So this is very much like, you know, SIFT, we talked about, or Harris corners, right? So the idea is that first we generate lots and lots of sparse feature matches between all the images in our set. And then we triangulate those out into 3D space, and we get a whole bunch of sparse 3D points. And in some sense, this is exactly like the result of uh, structure for motion, right? So we talked about match moving. What are the two parts of match moving? Number one, we recover the 3D camera positions and orientations, and number two, we recover sparse 3D point positions, right? Which is exactly what you guys discovered on your match moving homework, right? Where you had not only the 3D camera path, but also a bunch of 3D points in space, right? And so those are the beginning point for a patch-based algorithm. And so what you do is, okay, so then for every point that you can kind of successfully triangulate out there in the world, you build a little patch. So, like this. So, you initially triangulate some point in the world, that becomes your initial center of a patch. And then you can also estimate basically, so here what I've done is I've kind of drawn this like a five by five set of points in space on the patch, right? So I estimate a center and a normal for the patch, and then I kind of make a grid on that patch in the 3D world. And then I can project that grid down into each of the corresponding images that see that patch, and then I can do a little optimization problem over the center and the normal of the patch. And so what I do is, for every good sparse feature point that I have, I generate a little patch of texture in the world, and then I basically try and iteratively move the center and the normal of this patch around so it matches up as well as possible with what gets projected back down to the images, right? And so the result is that Basically, corresponding to kind of like every good point that I would have gotten from something like structure or motion, not only did I get a 3D point, but I got a little oriented piece of texture, right? Just a little square out in the 3D world, right? And so what I get is, at the end of this process, not just a cloud of 3D points, but I get a cloud of little textured patches out in the world. Okay, question? How do you determine the normal of those patches? How do you determine the normal of the patches? So one way to think about it is that first you kind of think about where is the, so one, one way of doing it would be to say, okay, let's find the best image of that patch in the world, right? So for example, you know, maybe you would say, okay, um, I have a reference camera and I could just say that the first candidate for the orientation of the patch is the normal that points from the center of the patch back towards my camera, right? And that gives me an initial estimate of what that patch would be. So the point is that I'm, I'm iteratively refining the orientation of that patch as I go, right? So all I need is an initialization. And so usually the initialization could just be the normal that points back to one of the cameras. Okay. Does that make sense? Sure. I mean, obviously I don't want to make it like perpendicular, or I, I don't want to make it like parallel to, or I don't want to make it perpendicular, I want to make it as, as front on to the image plane as I can, right? So the idea being that I'm assuming that a good patch of image texture kind of corresponds to some nice kind of frontally parallel surface out there in the 3D world. Maybe it's not exactly parallel to my image plane, but it's kind of close enough that that gives me a good place to start. And then I start to... I'm asking is because would such features and other sorts of features like that be maybe things that are on the edges of things? Right, right. So that's a good point, is that, you know, what if... Well, but the idea is that if I had a feature match, if I had a feature detection that was on the edge of something, then the idea is I wouldn't be able to match that very well to the other images. Because, for example, if I have a SIF feature that's on the edge of a building, half of it is on the building and half of it is like background behind the building, then if I see that from another point of view, I'm never going to get a good match in the first place, right? Understood. And so those, those get thrown out. You know, so I only, I only see this process with really good matches. Okay. That being said, I will talk about next time how can you deal with matching when you've got you know, something that's half on, half off the surface. And so we'll talk about that a little bit more when we talk about registration of 3D objects uh, next time. That's a good question, though. Um, so the idea is that once I have the uh, initial set of patches in the world, that's still pretty sparse, right? So now what I want to do is I want to make a dense set of matches. And what I do is I say, okay, so let's suppose that this light gray pixel was one from which I had a good match, right? So I kind of say, okay, that's this corresponding nice 3D square out here. What I can do is say, okay, for the pixel next door that didn't have a good set feature, what I can do is I can project out into the world array until I meet up with the plane defined by the patch of this guy. So that kind of means that I'm extending this light gray plane 
out into the world and I see where does the, where does the uh, ray through that intersect. And then I generate a candidate, darker gray patch, that has this center and the same normal as the other guy, and then I start to move that patch around, right? And so the idea is that, you know, I flow my correspondences out from, you know, good sparse correspondences out to places where I didn't maybe necessarily have good SIFT matches, but I'm pushing those patches out into the world, right? And so it is that I kind of am, you know, seeding the world with good patches from something like SIFT, and then I'm pushing them out with estimates, kind of under the assumption that I have surfaces in the scene that are not, you know, too different from each other, that they're relatively contiguous, right? Um, and so, obviously, to get this to really work requires a lot of careful programming, but that's the basic idea, is that fundamentally at the end of the day, you go from a sparse set of little patches to a, a dense set of little patches, and then you can use something like the algorithm we're going to talk about next time to turn all those you know, little patches into a more contiguous 3D model. Um, but this is really the you know, uh, key idea behind some of the cool stuff that's been coming out lately. For example, um, you know, one of the best researchers in this area Yasu Furukawa, um, you know, let's look at this guy here. So basically, you know, this is what you do if you have lots and lots of tourist photos of a certain place. Um, and so here they've got, you know, the Coliseum. And I may skip around this video, so apologize to Yasu for this. But, you know, you get like these very highly detailed, you know, surface meshes. And then I think you'll see as you zoom in kind of how then once you've got the 3D, then you can relight the model that matches up with a given photograph or a given position of the sun at a certain time of day. And so, you know, the relighting of the scene also really sells the idea that this is a 3D model. So this is an original picture. This is a rendered picture that kind of matches up with that as well as possible. And then you can kind of fly through the scene. You can see how good it looks. And here you can see there are some missing data pieces in the, you know, in the windows and so on. I guess the, these are actually holes in the real environment, but you know you can see the patches are not like totally perfect around the edges of things, but on the surfaces things look really good. And I think we can skip forward to, you know, here's a reconstruction of Venice. So again, around the edges of objects, you know, you, you see a little bit of noise along all these kind of spikes and uh, towers, but on the on the actual surfaces of objects things look really good. And then once you've textured the objects, things look even better, right? And so this is really, you know, pretty impressive. And again, this is possible because of the zillions of tourist photos of these places that you can put into your massive multi-view stereo algorithm, right? And so the details of, you know, how do you choose which images you should use as the basis for your MVS algorithm, you know, there's a lot of good work on that also. Um, and so, uh, Now, this is not to say that you would just be able to pop this onto your computer and, and do it in a few hours. I mean, this is like, I think I mentioned in a previous lecture, there was this kind of uh, building Rome in a day uh, paper. The idea was that you could take all these tourist photos of Rome and then how many, uh, you know, if you had all the clusters, uh, you know, of computational power in the world, how would you uh, try and get the 3D reconstruction done in 24 hours, right? But that was not 24 hours of a... Uh, single computer, it was 24 hours of like a, a ton of computers. Although lately it's come down to be a little bit more commodity. Like you can now download, for example, um, there's this nice thing called Visual SFM. So basically, uh, one nice thing about this, this patch-based multi-view stereo, PMVS, is that um, he made this publicly available. And so lots of commercial, or not some commercial, lots of kind of hobbyist stuff is built on top of the system. And so this uh, Visual SFM is a very nice way of just simply dropping images in, doing the automatic matching, doing the automatic 3D construction. And, you know, the matching, I think, may take a while. This is basically a real-time run of three minutes of watching it go. I'm not going to necessarily uh, watch it for all three minutes. But the idea is it really is just as easy as kind of loading up some images, generating these correspondences. And then what you see is, um, like at some point, you see it's basically inserting every camera into the scene one at a time. You can kind of see if you're reading this closely, there's stuff about bundle adjustment and number of 3D points. So basically, this is solving an incremental structure for motion problem, like the match moving problems we talked about in chapter six. And so after you solve all these one by one match moving problems, then you call basically this 
you know, execute dense reconstruction by PMVS, and now it takes a few minutes to go from these sparse points to a dense set of points. And that's a little bit harder to see, but you can see that at the very end of this video, they kind of toggle something where now this person's working in the dense world instead of the sparse world. You can see like all the, all the holes between the points kind of click in. And so this is definitely something to fool around with if you're curious about uh, doing dense reconstruction. Um, another thing, I guess, while I'm talking about it, uh, so there are other things. Here's another like web-based multi-view reconstruction. So you kind of take your images and it uploads it to some server somewhere and then it you know does it. One thing that's really, um, well, actually, let me let me just go back for one second, finish up my lecture on the topics, and I'll come back to the to the tools. I saw a question though. Is he the same guys who did phototourism? Yes, the phototourism guys know Yasu very well, and so like there's definitely a big connection between uh, that whole group of University of Washington alumni and this project, right? Uh, and so um, yes, so basically the PMVS sits on top of, I believe, this software from Noah Snavely called Bundler. That basically is the heart of phototourism. It's basically like a large structure for motion, you know, large scale structure for motion from image collections thing. And so, what you need to make all this work is you need to get Bundler, you need to get PMVS, you need to put it all together, you know. Uh, but you know, that's something that when it came on the scene, suddenly it enabled kind of the average person to do multi-view stereo in a way that you couldn't have dreamed of doing before. And so, I want to show one last thing at the end. Um, so, let me just finish up my my technical part of the lecture here. Um, this is just an example of of a multi-viewer stereo result. The last thing I wanted to say, I guess, is that you can do things with, um, instead of trying to estimate the three positions of points, you can also think about this as trying to estimate a bunch of simultaneous depth maps from my images, right? So we know that um, basically, it's kind of analogous to say, okay, for this point in this, in this image, I want to estimate its physical 3D depth, right? And once I know that depth, then I can basically push forward this little block of pixels or this pixel and color that point in space, right? And so this is what I would call a depth map fusion idea. So the last kind of technique I would say is depth map fusion. And so the idea there is that, you know, in each uh, image, and I guess I can't really say much better than, than this picture. So in each image, each image kind of takes turns being the reference image. And what I do is very pixel in the image, I kind of hypothesize, okay, so what should the depth in this, what should the depth at this pixel be? So I push out a ray into 3D space and say, okay, well, that's where the pixel will be from this camera's perspective. If it was really there in 3D, then I can project that back down onto all the other images and look at the neighborhoods of that pixel in the resulting images and say, okay, well, do these neighborhoods here match up with this neighborhood over here? And if they do, then that depth is a good candidate. And if they don't, then it's probably not the right depth. And so you can imagine that, you know, very crudely what you could do is just kind of like optimize over this D of P for every, you know, as a function of D for every pixel and then kind of get estimates based on how consistent I see the you know, corresponding pixel neighborhoods in these other images. So it's actually very similar to the idea of what we talked about with the with the surface space reconstruction, where I'm kind of pushing forward points, projecting them back down on the images, and using the image to image matches as a basis for comparison. And again, you probably want to be smart about how do you, you know, not just looking at squares or rectangles around the corresponding points, but also uh, looking at you know the the deformed rectangles that come from perspective distortion as I, you know, look at surfaces from very different angles, right? So I probably don't want to compare squares to squares. I want to compare squares to little squishy point, you know, squished squares or fat squares. Also known as rectangles, I guess. Um, okay. And I guess the last thing I would say about just general uh, multi-view stereo is that obviously you can always do better if you kind of do a hybrid of just images and something like what we talked about last time. So if I were to also allow myself to project structured light into the scene, just put some light stripes in the world to give me some texture on objects, well, then I can do even better, right? Because now I've got the best of both worlds. I've got, you know, all the stuff that comes from stereo correspondence, and I've got kind of some introduced texture that I can use to help me with featureless regions of the world, right? 
Okay. So what I was saying here is that you know this has become very commoditized, and so here is this uh, service from Autodesk called 123D Cache. Now on your phone, although it doesn't actually work on your phone. You take the pictures on your phone, right? So here this guy is going around his kid. Now you basically upload them to a service and you get a 3D model that comes back at you, right? Um, and people kind of do this with their food and with their, yeah, here you go, sushi, uh, you know. And, you know, you can see that there are some places where you don't necessarily get uh, all the data back. But then, you know, Autodesk has actually done a pretty nice thing where now you can uh, print out these objects, you know, so you can do some editing of the objects um, and you can, you know, crop with planes and so on. And now you make the 3D printout, you know, so I started making action figures yesterday. So actually, you know, probably if you're going to make an action figure, this is probably an easier way to do it than using the scanner that we had last time, right? Because then you've got this, uh, you know, so I, I don't know how much they charge you to print the object, but the, the 3D reconstruction part is free, right? So I downloaded this on my phone yesterday and made this model um, of my, my Totoro in the book, right? And so, you know, I just went around and took, um, you know, about 20 pictures. And here you can kind of see that things are not perfect. Like there's a, there's a chunk of texture that for every, whatever reason here it didn't get. And so you can kind of like, you're almost looking through the object. And you can also see that actually the book, right, is not super great because like there's lots of weird, looks like this book has been bashed around a little bit. It's kind of blended in with my, you know, my leather, you know, coffee table a little bit. So, you know, there are lots of reasons why this could be true. You know, one, one thing that will defeat or mess up a multi-view stereo algorithm is reflections and specularities. And so the book is shiny. This was on a day where, you know, there was light coming through the windows. And so the reflections on the surfaces of these objects are going to definitely confuse these algorithms they're trying to say are, you know, are these things photo consistent, right? And so if you really want to do this the right way, you should try and control your lighting so that there are not a lot of bouncy reflections off of things, right? That's going to be a problem. But, you know, in terms of the, you know, in terms of the Totoro, which is actually, you know, a matte object, I'm actually kind of surprised. Maybe this is just that I didn't let it load long enough. But you know, the the 3D reconstruction of this guy is pretty good, except for like you can see that it didn't really totally resolve the gap between this little tree branch and uh, and its head, right? So if I were to zoom in on this a little bit, right? So here, this kind of appears to be still a filled-in hole, whereas it probably shouldn't be. Um, and also, you can see that there's some texture issue. Like here, you know, the, the head of hey, go away, kid. The head of this uh, guy has some sort of a green leafy texture that, again, came from some sort of erroneous estimation of what the color should be at that surface. So, that, so the surface itself has got the right, um, you know, it's got the right. Uh, I don't know how I get back to the non-zoomed version. Sorry, ah, <laughs> it's freaking me out. Maybe if I. Where to do this? Yes, okay, so now I'm back to the thing. Uh, sort of. I think I'm, yeah, here we go. Yeah. Yeah. So you can see, you know, not only did it, did it get some of my table, but it also got some of my sofa that's further away, right? So it's kind of only giving me the patches that it was able to get good estimates for. But, you know, this is definitely worth playing around with. Um, and actually, you know, if you were a little more careful than I was about taking pictures, it does work pretty well, right? Um, one other thing that, um, you know, kind of apropos of what's going on these days. So I don't know if anyone played this L.A. Noir video game. Was I the only one? All right. So L.A. Noir was this kind of um, very interesting facial motion capture situation where they had, instead of having a uh, kind of animated face, what, well, I mean, it, w it was an animated face, but basically what they did was they had all the actors perform with, uh, I think, that, well, I'll just let this play. Th they did all the facial expressions inside this multi-camera studio. Um, so this is basically kind of like a multi-view stereo situation. And then they uh, would stream a version of this captured dialogue into the game in real time, right? And so this is the original on the left, and the right is the motion capture thing, or the, the, the multi-view stereo thing. And so really what they're doing is they're estimating you know, real-time 3D position and texture. And 
I gotta say that when you when you see it in the game, it really is very different than other avatars in video games, right? Like they had all of these. Of course, the idea was that you know part of it is that you're trying to look at people's expressions and tell are they telling the truth or are they lying, right? And so part of the key is that they wanted to capture actors who were making these kinds of like shifty-eyed expressions and so on, and they you know it actually I think was fairly successful. I mean, there there were points where it was kind of uncanny valley, but there were a lot of points where it was also like you know you could really buy that this was a person, um, and so like as you watch towards the end of this video, you know. It's not like it's some like kind of crummy CGI version of something. It really is the person's face that's been put onto these 3D models. Part of it, part of the part that was a little bit tricky was that you know the bodies were separately motion captured, and then they kind of stitched the moving heads onto these bodies. Uh, and also, you know, things like clothes and hats and stuff like that inevitably look a little bit weird. Like when you put the hat on the person, you know, it looks a little bit. You know, like the hat doesn't seem to sit totally well, but um, you know that was really uh, an impressive step forward. And unfortunately, I don't know that any other games have really gone on to do anything quite like this because it was a huge undertaking for them to figure out how to make this work. But that was really one of the selling points of the game was that you, know, you really got this sense of uh, personality coming from the from the faces in the game. So, yeah, it was pretty neat. So. Um, Another thing that actually just came off the uh, press is the new Google Camera app, which uh, does basically on your phone refocusing or, or blurring of an image, right? And so, um, so maybe some of you guys are familiar with this Lytro camera. So the Lytro camera is something that does this with what's called a light field in hardware. So it actually is generating you know, a lot of different actual physical images of the scene, just a little bit separated so that you can do kind of changes in parallax, little changes in viewpoint, little changes in refocusing, because it's got lots of actual images of the world, right? Whereas here, you've only got one image of the world, or so it seems. What's actually happening is that, you know, you, you are basically asked to move your camera a little bit when you take the picture, and what it's really doing is a multi-view multi stereo algorithm where it creates a depth map, right? And so in addition to having the picture, it has the depth associated with every pixel, and that's what lets you do basically interactive, you know, refocusing the image, because then they can say, okay, I know that all this stuff is closer to the camera, so it should be sharp, and all this stuff is further away, so I apply a little bit of a blur to it, right? So it's kind of like a software version of the Lytro camera, right? And I'm sure the Lytro people are probably a little bit unhappy with stuff like this, right? Because it really is... Uh, yeah, but if you look at what's underneath the hood, right, they're saying they're using structure for motion, bundle adjustment, both of you stereo, right? And so the key is that you don't just have a single image to work from, you have a series of images that you use to create the depth map, right? Um, and so, again, you, actually, if you look at this Google research blog, after taking this course, you should be able to understand pretty much everything that's in this paragraph about first they do structure for motion, then they do bundle adjustment, then they do multi-view stereo, and you know, there's some interesting uh, problems about how do you do this quickly on your phone, because un unlike the 123 to catch, this one is not farming anything out to the cloud to do computations, it's all doing it on the spot. So they have to have a fairly efficient um, you know, structure for motion and multi-view stereo algorithm to work on your phone. Um, Okay, let's see if there's anything else I want to say here. Well, I think that that's pretty much it for the moment. So I, I would say that, you know, again, if you want to know what's really the best multi-view stereo algorithm at a given moment, then this Middlebury uh, place is the first place to look for kind of um, understanding how good things are, right? And so you can sort basically by, you know, whether you care about accuracy or percentage completion, whether you care about the view on all of, all of the views or just a subset of the views. And you can see here these Furukawa 2, Furukawa 3. Furukawa is the researcher that I told you about before. I'm not sure if we have a... Uh, mostly over any portion. Oh yeah, so here we go. So basically, these papers here by Furukawa are the original patch-based multi-view stereo papers. And so you can see that these are still at the top of the stack. And so I think it's fair to say that you know, patch-based methods are still pretty good. But I don't think that the, uh, I, think I, I think I remember reading that the lens blur in Google Camera is actually a very, you know, computationally much simpler algorithm that actually probably 
is not very high on this list, but can run quickly on your mobile phone, right? And you know, it's still for the purposes of refocusing your selfie, looks good enough, right? You don't need to have like super accurate depth map to be able to do this kind of foreground, background blur, you know, because because that's the kind of thing that you're taking a picture of, right? Usually, you know, you're going to be sufficiently separated from your background. If the only problem is telling which pixels are in the foreground, I think you can probably do that pretty well with a relatively simple algorithm. Okay, so any questions about multi-view stereo? So it really is worth uh, downloading the multi-view or down downloading the Autodesk One Two Three D Catch. Uh, there's a there's a app on the phone. There's a uh, you know desktop version. And then there's a web version. And I had a hard time getting all three of them to play well together. But certainly you can get the phone stuff onto your web app, and then you can fool around with what's on the web app, right? Um, and like I said, I'd be very curious to see the whole pipeline going from the acquisition to the 3D printing. I think that would be pretty pretty neat. So, okay. So, in that case, I will 